Um, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this EPC policy dialogue that is going to be looking at the EU response to the crisis in Belarus and the impact of these responses so far. This is actually the third event that EPC has done uh, this year on Belarus. I wish I could say that the situation in the country has actually improved, that new elections were around the corner, um, but unfortunately, this is not the case. The situation in Belarus uh, remains really perilous. Thousands of peaceful protesters have been violently beaten. It's estimated that over 35,000 people have actually been detained. Hundreds are in prison. Um, as we know, uh, Vitold Ashurok died in prison uh, in May. Uh, Lukashenko and his regime continues to cling to power with Moscow continuing to support him. During the NATO summit earlier this week, the Lithuanian president actually said that Russia was trying to swallow uh, Belarus, but I'm sure we're going to be discussing about Russia's role in this uh, later on. Those that oppose uh, Lukashenko both inside and outside the country remain at serious risk. I mean, they really remain at serious risk. Uh, and we saw this most recently with the state-sponsored hijacking of the Ryanair flight uh, and the detainment of Roman uh, Protasevich and Sofia Sapega. We've also seen that uh, Roman has unfortunately been, you know, dragged out several times, made to uh, lie and say false things in a in a in a terrible in a terrible terrible way. Um, since the beginning of the crisis, the EU has responded um, in various different ways, which we are going to hear about very shortly. Its strongest response yet um, came after this plane hijacking, uh, with EU leaders responding really quickly uh, and with one voice. And this is not something that happens very often uh, in EU foreign policy. So I think this reflects the real seriousness of this situation. So our speakers today are going to lay out what the EU has been doing, um, what else uh, is in the EU's toolkit that could potentially um, be used, what has been the impact so far of the EU's responses, including the sanctions um, that have been placed. I mean, the sanctions have been, let's say, ratcheted up um, over a period of time, with the most serious ones being delivered uh, most recently. Um, we're also going to look at the developments, or what these developments in Belarus mean for regional security, um, not least for Ukraine, but also for NATO's eastern flank, uh, and also some other issues, including the possibility here for greater transatlantic um, cooperation, which is really important uh, when you're dealing with a situation as serious of the, as this. Uh, and I'm really pleased today that we have three um, very good experts um, on Belarus, both, both officials um, and non-officials. Um, first of all, I'm delighted that we have the EU's ambassador um, in Belarus with us today, His Excellency um, Dirk Shubo. Uh, so he's the man on the ground there that can give us really a picture of what's going on in the country from his, his perspective. Um, I'm also delighted that we have Mr. Maciej Popowski, who is Acting Director General of, of DG NIA in the European um, Commission. Um, and last but not least, um, Professor Giselle Bosse, who's Associate Professor in EU External Relations at Maastricht University. And uh, Giselle has been working on Belarus for, for many, many years. So she's well placed to really comment on Belarus and um, what's going on in the country. Um, to the audience, um, I would like to ask you uh, to put your questions by either clicking on the hand icon or by typing into the Q&A box. Um, and please start to put your questions um, early on so that I can sort of include them into the conversation uh, and the discussion. Um, so I'd like to start by giving the floor to um, Ambassador uh, Schubel, um, to you, uh, Dirk, so you can give us a picture of how you see things in the country at the moment. Thank you very much, Amanda. Good uh, morning or Good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are, to all uh, colleagues. Very happy to have been invited. Many thanks. Since uh, you have limited the, uh, my inter intervention time to seven minutes, I will go straight into the, uh, into the main topic. Uh, I think we have, unfortunately, to say that the situation in Belarus today is worse than in August 2020, when we saw all the massive demonstrations starting following the falsified uh, presidential elections. 
people are afraid to go out to the streets. They are afraid of being sent to jail. They are afraid of losing their jobs, of being exmatriculated at their universities. Uh, we have by now, state of today, 481 political prisoners. Compared to 2011, when we had the last big crisis with Belarus, there were 29 political prisoners. So just uh, for those who know, do not know, to see the dimension of the problem which, in which we are. 35,200 detentions, over 1,100 students and teachers and lecturers um, uh, affected by the repressions, 4,600 complaints uh, about police violence, none of them investigated. Attacks on media have continued. We have recently had a massive attack on the biggest uh, independent medium, uh, Tutbai. Um, human rights defenders are attacked. Uh, political commentators, uh, Mr. Schreibmann, who many of you know, uh, had to leave the country recently as well because he was mentioned by in one of the uh, forced appearances by Roman Protasevich uh, personally. So he better thought he better leaves and uh, he is now in, in Ukraine at this moment. So um, attacks on us, on diplomats have continued. We have a number of uh, diplomats expelled. Uh, three EU member states ambassadors, um, Lithuania, Latvia and Poland and many of their diplomatic staff have been expelled. And of course the highlight was the, hi the hijacking of the um, uh, Ryan airplane uh, on the 23rd of uh, May. Um, the legislation, I should mention, has been widely sharpened uh, by the regime so that we have now basically no possibility to, for legal uh, protests, for legal, for expressing legally non-conformist approaches. It is, uh, and of course, those who commit such uh, alleged violations face big uh, and long prison charges. The Catholic Church and the Polish minority has been attacked. The Orthodox Church, even if there are some players who will not play ball with the regime, are also attacked. And of course, the information side, the big Pochomkin village has been presented to us here over the last year. Big fairy tales have been presented by Lukashenko's telegram channels and by the official media. How has been our reaction? I think uh, you mentioned already partially, we have the council conclusions of October 2020, which are still valid. I don't repeat them. You all can look them up. And now we have three, until now we have three sanctions package, uh, packages. The fourth is under preparation and is hopefully passed uh, at either at the next Foreign Affairs Council meeting on the 21st in one week time or, um, uh, uh, or a bit earlier even. We also prepare a package related only to the Ryanair hijacking uh, specific package, which is also about to get ready. Of course, we do not work with the regime anymore in many ways, although we keep uh, co co contacts of conversation open I try to meet uh, on a regular basis the deputy foreign minister dealing with our part of the world. Uh, we meet, but of course there's uh, very little uh, in common that we, that we have to discuss. Um, so on the support measures, I will all leave to, to, to Mace to mention. Uh, this, the package you mentioned already on aviation that we have imposed, uh, that is uh, indeed so far the biggest sanction, but I think the ones that are going to come are uh, much tougher. What are, we, what are we doing locally? We visit regularly the political prisoners when there are court proceedings. We cannot visit them uh, in, in, in jail. We have tried to do so. We don't even get a reply, uh, but uh, we visit the court proceedings, which is not to the liking of the regime. The uh, so-called journalists of the regime, they're hassling uh, diplomats who want to attend these, uh, these meetings, which is of course absolutely um, uh, not okay. Um, we have also done many actions in support. We had uh, last week uh, a big meeting. The whole diplomatic corps was invited by Foreign Minister McKay. Uh, during this meeting, I, uh, on behalf of the EU member states, ambassadors issued, uh, read out a, a big joint statement, which was very critical. And following the meeting, we issued an even bigger joint statement, namely together with the US, with Switzerland, with the UK and with Japan, in which we outlined our position. Um, opposition, one word on the opposition briefly. Um, the majority of them is either in Poland, in Lithuania or in jail. So there are very few real opposition figures who are still free. There's uh, one uh, figure which is uh, close to uh, Babariko, uh, Maxim Bogdetsov. He's still uh, there and we meet him regularly, but he is, uh, of course, uh, let's hope he stays free. Let's put it this way. Um, we, we tell them that they need to be aligned, the opposition. They're trying their best, but it's not easy if you're in different places and maybe not even there. Um, what uh, should be the way out? The way out is, of course, to fulfill the Council conclusions of the EU, namely all to release all political prisoners, to stop the violence and to organize new presidential elections under OSC observation. Uh, and of course, you should do this, uh, the regime should do this by agreeing finally to an inclusive dialogue with the people of, uh, of Belarus. 
the OSC should, should play a helping role. They stand ready to do so, the Swedish chairmanship in office. Uh, we have also the Benedict report of the, um, of the under the support Moscow mechanism, which should be implemented. Um, and of course, we have also um, uh, created a lot to, uh, in terms of accountability of the so far totally uh, the Belarusian authorities, which enjoy total immunity. Um, so there is a number, number of mechanisms we have uh, under the UN uh, established an international uh, mechanism. And we have also established with the help of Denmark, Germany and the UK an international accountability platform for Belarus, which uh, lists every human rights violation that we know about a long list so that people and perpetrators are not forgotten at the future stage uh, when they can be held responsible. So uh, to cut a long story short, I do not think that this current standoff can last very long. Uh, the people have not changed their mind. They cannot take to the streets, but at some stage, uh, 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 this will uh, express themselves in one way or another. This could last a month, a year or two. We don't know. Uh, we hope not so long, but we still have to hope that uh, the regime comes to uh, reason and finally agrees to, uh, to the aforementioned steps and, uh, and also reaches out to the people. Um, and that can probably only be achieved by uh, gradually increasing pressure, which we're trying to hold via the on them via the uh, sanctions packages. I'll stop here. Happy to answer all your questions also on Russia and, and other factors that are playing a role. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Dirk. Before I move on to Mr. Popowski, I would just like to put a couple of um, additional questions. I mean, as you're based in um, Belarus, I mean, could you give us a picture now um, what sort of support remains in the country you know, for, for the Lukashenko um, regime, because we hear different, you know, numbers, I mean, in terms of how much of the population still, for whatever reason, um, actually support him. Um, and secondly, I mean, how is the EU viewed in Belarus um, in terms of what they've done so far? I mean, if they're even aware of what they've done so far, I mean, is, is the EU communicating um, the steps it's taken so far sufficiently enough? so that the broader population know about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Armanda. Well, support for the regime is difficult to assess uh, because, because there are no official, uh, of course, uh, pollings or anything like this. We estimate that the support is even less big now uh, after, the, after Lukashenko used uh, violence against its own, his own people following the elections. Uh, let him have had at the elections, uh, I don't know, 25%. And I think the support, or we believe that the support now for Lukashenko is less than that, between 15 and 20. Uh, there are still, uh, there is still a support group, so we should not underestimate this, but it is by far not the majority which the regime wants to make believe to, to, to the outside world. On EU views, uh, first of all, we have to be clear and we have to and we know that, that EU is not the number one player. The most popular uh, partner in Belarus is Russia, and it will also remain like this, which is very logical because Russia or Belarus is the closest uh, also in mindset uh, of uh, uh, a partner of Russia and it will remain like this. And it's, it, that is also the reason why it is also so important for, for Russia, of course. Um, so, uh, however, the EU ratings, uh, there are some informal surveys being made. They have increased uh, uh, at the end of last year, they had increased to, to about 32, 33% from before 28, 27% of support. And the support for Russia went down uh, to from, I think, uh, 48 or something like this to 42, 43%. So it's still clearly on top, of course, Russia, but we have been catching up. On our support measures, we try to make them known. We do, we work here mainly with Facebook. Uh, the thing is independent media, which so far also took up, picked up our actions. Uh, they have been uh, shut up basically, uh, such as Tutbai, which uh, was also helpful in communicating messages uh, to, the, uh, to the population. And obviously in the state media, we, we read nothing, zero on any of our actions. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that is of course uh, not so easy. However, I think the, many people know what we're doing and they appreciate it very much. They wished us to be even more active. They wished in particular more sanctions uh, that we are getting a lot of letters and notes where people say we are ready to suffer a bit if uh, this can help uh, to you know, change the, uh, the situation. Um, uh, economically, they're talking about economically, we're ready to suffer a bit. Um, uh, so, that is, so that is why also the EU is rather encouraged uh, together with other Western partners to do more uh, in order to tell the regime that we do not appreciate their, their leavings. So EU's view is, uh, is quite good, positive. 
but it's of course not comparable to Georgia or Ukraine or where we are on the forefront that we have to know. Thank you, um, Dirk. I'll come back to you again a bit later on, but now I want to give the floor to Mr. Popowski um, so that he can explain what the EU has been doing um, most recently. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Good morning to everybody. Um, good to see you. Dirk, thank you very much for holding the fort. I know how difficult it is, but you, you've been doing a great job. Uh, Look, I, I very much uh, um, uh, I agree with the with the reading of uh, Dirk. The situation is grim. It's appalling, and it's so close. Uh, and we've been following that very closely. I, I think that our reaction was indeed timely and um, and and decisive. And there is more to come. Um, uh, and, and you could see that, uh, in particular, the reaction to the hijacking of the Ryanair fl flight was. Uh, was really quick and uh, and to the point. Um, let me say a few words about uh, um, things that we've been doing since the beginning of, of the crisis. Um, because our main objective was already last year to send a clear message of support to the Belarusian uh, people. Um, and we uh, basically suspended all cooperation with the regime and its institutions and that will have implications for the future as well. And we reoriented all our assistance to make sure that, uh, that whatever we provide goes to people that need it and not, and we don't want to do anything that would legitimize, legitimize the, the regime. Uh, of course, the, uh, the space for, for civil society and media has been shrinking um, and we know it, uh, but still, um, we, we, we managed to, uh, uh, we still managed to, to cooperate. So what have been, uh, what have we done so far? Um, first of all, there was emergency assistance. So um, uh, we, uh, we provided uh, support to uh, 800 victims of, of repression, legal support, medical aid, psychological assistance. We also, as, as Dirk has uh, explained, uh, we also uh, support the accountability platform. Uh, and this is a very useful initiative also for the for the future. Um, then, uh, even though the civil society and the, uh, the opposition human rights defender, defenders and, and free media are under, are under a huge amount of pressure, and many have left, of course, uh, uh, we managed to reach those who are still um, uh, in the country through either the European Endowment for Democracy, which ha has become a partner of choice for, for the actions uh, on the ground uh, or through uh, civil society framework uh, uh, partners. So um, we, um, um, uh, we still uh, maintain a reasonable level of, of engagement. Then there is uh, the education, uh, which is really important, not least because of the potential of the country. Um, uh, and and uh, and we want to come up with an offer for the young generation. I mean, of course, many people leave. I understand it, but but those who who stay or who would like to return to the country, they can count on us. So it started with support to the the ongoing support to the to the European Humanities University that has been in exile in Vilnius for. Uh, uh, more than 10 years, I think 12 or 13 years now. Um, um, and uh, we also um, uh, put together a dedicated scholarship uh, program uh, for the upcoming uh, academic year uh, that will offer students and professionals the opportunity of uh, to pursue their, their academic interest, uh, either uh, in, uh, uh, in Belarus through online platforms as well, or uh, as a matter of fact, in the EU member states. And we've been uh, working very closely with a, a number of member states uh, uh, involved. Um, we've been helping the, uh, the small and medium-sized enterprises because there is a private sector, in particular, the IT sector has been booming in, in, in Belarus, as we know, they have a lot of potential. It has to do with the level of technical education that is, uh, that is very good. Um, uh, so uh, we provided advice and, and access to uh, to finance. So as of March, uh, 40 uh, small and medium-sized enterprises um, have received loans 
um, uh, funded by uh, by us. And then we continue with uh, uh, with COVID nineteen uh, support. This is of course challenging because we want to reach the people, and and in a country like Belarus, there are no alternative channels than than the government. Uh, but we are looking at all options. I can't tell you more because we don't know yet. But uh, but this is of course we don't want to 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 let them uh, to let anybody down. Um, well, I'm, I'm sure um, many of you have uh, have heard or read about the the comprehensive plan of economic support for for democratic future Belarus. That was actually a task in giving to the Commission by the European Council back, back in October, uh, and it materialized recently. Um, the, an announcement was was made uh, at the end of May. Um, it's a it's a substantial three billion investment package for Belarus. Um, a, a token of our commitment to, to the strengthening of the recovery, economic recovery and democratic developments in Belarus. The plan covers uh, financial injections uh, for macroeconomic stability, support to economic and, and democratic uh, reforms, uh, support to independent media and, and civil, uh, civil society. I mean, I can be a bit more specific and that maybe may during the Q&A session, but what, what is important is that it was endorsed at the highest political level. Um, the opposition um, uh, has uh, come out uh, in, in support, have welcomed the publication of the plan. And actually, since last October, we've been in touch regularly with Svetlana Tifanovska and her team in, in, in both in Brussels and in several capitals. Um, and that continues, by the way. So when we were working on the, on the, uh, the outline of the plan, we've consulted with them uh, uh, quite, quite a lot. Uh, what we have in mind for the future, once the conditions are in place, is to, to set up a, an investment forum for Belarus and a high-level donor meeting to uh, mobilize additional funding from, from you know, the IMF and, and, and development banks um, that, we can, that we can once again target the, the private sector. Um, and, um, and then uh, we are ready to develop a number of, uh, of flagship uh, 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 projects or programs for, for Belarus um, uh, to help the country uh, regain its economic stability and rebuild its, uh, its institutions. I know it sounds hypothetical because it's not going to materialize anytime soon, but it's good to have a plan. And it's also, it, it was in a way a booster for, for the, the people and for the, uh, for the democratic uh, opposition that we are, we are there with them and we are ready to, to support them whenever the, uh, the conditions are, are in place. I will stop here, but of course, I'll be happy to come back uh, to answer questions or react to comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Papowski, for this very comprehensive overview um, of what the EU has been doing. I would just like to follow up with a couple of questions I have already um, in, the, in the chat box um, from Mr. Klaus Klipp. Um, and he's asking, um, what are the plans from the EU to overcome the problems around information for citizens in Belarus? I guess he's talking about disinformation. Um, and also, does the EU institutions already started to work on the next steps regarding Belarus? Um, or do you plan to leave it as it is? I think you've sort of mentioned this just before, um, but maybe there's something more you could elaborate in terms of, of our um, things that are in the pipeline, sanctions, etc. I mean, if the situation means that the EU needs to go first. Uh, on the on the first um, question on the, uh, the 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 media landscape, of course it's limited, but but we we have to work with those who are who are there. Because there was also media based either in in, in Russia uh, or in the EU member states, hmm? uh, like the uh, the uh, the Pope, the, the um, Belsat uh, uh, satellite television that is based in, in Poland has been operating since I think it was two thousand five when it was set up, um, and and so they still reach uh, an audience. Um, but whenever we support and we do uh, Russian-speaking media based elsewhere, they can also reach people in in Belarus because there is no language barriers. So it's it's certainly uh, uh, worthwhile. Um, on the next steps, I mean, the positive agenda is in a way 
encapsulated in the in the plan for future Belarus. So there's not that much we can add, and it, and I think it's 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 pretty comprehensive. And 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 the, the negative agenda, Dirk mentioned, explained, and the 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 the, the, the sanctions, sanctions package has already passed, and there is more in the making. Now we are looking at sectors. I mean, we know what sectors of the Belarusian economy do matter and are of interest also for Russia, for instance, which is the chemical industry or the uh, um, the automotive industry. Um, but but this is still uh, being being discussed and and um, and the EU foreign ministers when they meet in Luxembourg next Monday will also have a go. Um, I, I don't know, as, as Duke said, it's not clear yet whether whether the council will decide on the sanctions, but it certainly will discuss further um, measures. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to turn to um, to you, um, Giselle, um, to get your perspective of how you see the situation uh, in Belarus, but also how you would evaluate the response of the EU so far. I mean, I know many experts um, criticized um, the EU for not having a tough enough response, you know, several months ago. Of course, you know, the, the, the explanation for this was that they hoped that it would prevent um, Belarus from falling into the arms of Russia totally, but that doesn't seem to have been the case. Um, so how do you see the response of the EU? Do you think things could have been done differently? And if so, how? Yeah, thank you very much, Amanda, and also thank you for the uh, for the invitation. Um, it's a, it's a great great pleasure joining you again. Um, I think on the situation of Belarus, this has been covered very well. Perhaps the only one issue one could add is that, of course, the message after uh, the Potasiewicz arrest uh, has been to also the diaspora, to everyone who's abroad, all Belarusians abroad, and the message was very clear: you're nowhere safe. I think uh, I think that's also a dimension not to be yeah, neglected um, here. But uh, I, I I would perhaps not want to comment further on the situation inside Belarus, um, as as it has been covered, um, and and I believe uh, the situation has also, yeah, as was said before, has worsened significantly. So when we talk about the effects of the yeah, EU's action so far, I mean it's it's a little bit. I think we have to be also realistic. I mean, it's very easy to say what the EU should have done, uh, but perhaps the correct question to ask is what can the EU actually do? Um, and if, if we look at that, uh, what the EU has done so far and in terms of the reactions, also making sure that all the member states agree, um, I think a lot has been done. And what was the most important is indeed the signal also to civil society, to the opposition. Yeah, the EU uh, sees a problem. Uh, <laughs> the EU is there. The EU is a, a community of values. Um, and we are ready to, yeah, we are recognizing the situation in Belarus and we, we're trying to help. And I think it should not be underestimated. I mean, the simple presence of the EU um, is, I think, is, is very, very important. Um, when it comes to other effects, uh, effects on the regime, uh, effects on Lukashenko, also realistically, of course, you know, what did we expect? Uh, the, the effects were none. Um, in, in terms of the behavior or changing behavior, but that was, as I said before, that was probably, yeah, that, that we could have not have expected. Um, what one does see is, of course, the more, you know, one isolates Belarus, the closer the ties with Russia uh, become, um, and the closer the, uh, the, 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 yeah, the ties uh, between Belarus and the Russian Federation. And if the EU in the past ever had, yeah, or had leverage, and, you know, as was already mentioned before, the EU had to start with little, um, uh, uh, little of that uh, leverage, uh, simply because Russia is and has been uh, the preferred partner and also through the subsidies um, uh, related to the uh, oil products and, and, and trade there, um, always, had, always had a point of significant pressure on the regime. Uh, but then again, if the EU had leverage, it was because Lukashenko was very keen on balancing between Russia and the West. And I say relative balancing here because it's relative, uh, taking into account how much power um, influence uh, uh, Russia had uh, already before through these uh, subsidies and loans, et cetera, et cetera. So if there was that, that leverage, and that I think here the EU you know, has used in the past, uh, but now through the hijacking of the plane and already the reaction before, of course, the violent reaction to protests, Lukashenko has very consciously taken the decision 
um, that this balancing will stop. Uh, and that puts the EU in a position where the, the leverage that it had in that balancing situation is, is almost gone. And that I think it also greatly limits is anything that is about you know, the effect uh, on, on the regime. And I think the measures like holding micro, uh, macro financial assistance um, is good that, you know, that there's a lot of lucrative uh, sources of income, uh, also for Lukashenko close uh, oligarchs in the country. Um, the lending schemes, European Investment Bank, EBRD lending, ring fenced, also very important measures, of course, because you really do not want to uh, uh, support uh, Belarusian government uh, dictatorship organizations. Um, I think the measures, of course, on flights, and I think here the, the losses for, for the regime are not as, as big. I think if anything, it could have an impact on the airline. And I think perhaps Russian oligarchs are already looking into that um, uh, because they find that perhaps interesting assets. And when it comes to restrictive measures, again, I think the for the EU, the restrictive measures that it has, I think it, it just shows, okay, we are doing something and it's important. Uh, when it comes to the impact of the measures, I have to say uh, it is clear that the US sanctions left a bigger impression on the regime. And the US, and you can see that because the oligarchs react. Uh, and, and the oligarchs uh, already reacted just before the US sanctions uh, against several companies in early June. Uh, for example, it's just one of these examples. Uh, Naftan, uh, the company, uh, the refining company, is mainly as, as the biggest producer um, of these additive oils and fuels. Um, they changed name. So, um, <laughs> and not just that, they also changed ownership. Um, they changed the structure of the company and they are now called Edytech, LLC. Right. So we have uh, an immediate response uh, before, uh, but very at last minute, as a matter of fact, <laughs> before the US sanctions. Um, and similar also, you know, someone who's also on the EU sanctions or restrictive measure list, Mikhail Varabay, um, export of petrochemicals, uh, pro-Russian, uh, also works with uh, Ukrainian pro-Russian uh, oligarchs, many links there. Um, but he also, he registers all these assets away from himself and it's now with top managers. That's also putting him, uh, he, but, but they react. And the same also with Alex, uh, um, uh, Alexei, uh, Energy Energo Oil Company. So here he transferred the shares to his son. And increasingly, very interesting, we recently we see also a lot of offshore activities of various Belarusian oligarchs, uh, Bahamas, Barbados, Curacao, and transfers there for services. Oh, money is being shuffled elsewhere outside the EU, obviously. Um, so, so they react, but they, they react. And, and the right, main reason for the reaction is and something the EU also can't do. Again, we have to be realistic, is because the US has these extraterritorial sanctions. And so all the companies that are yeah, linked, Western companies, um, uh, linked to Naftan, et cetera, et cetera, all these uh, transactions, that is something that they are worried about because that could, you know, that, that would really lead to consequences and hence you see reactions. So very much agree with the point, you know, if the EU acts in conjunctions with the US and other countries, you know, to make these economic sanctions work. However, there's a downside to this and then I also stop. Uh, the downside is of course at the moment one targets key Belarusian state companies, of which most of them are state companies. Uh, of course, there has been now also recently, uh, Lukashenko moved uh, to, to give uh, some of these uh, of ownership to, to oligarchs, but they also tend to change and get replaced. But in any case, um, once these are targeted, one, one, yeah, one weakens these companies. And they have, of course, also Lukashenko was very keen on keeping these companies core by the Russian companies out of Russian oligarchs orbit. Uh, and and that, is, that is a tricky issue. Um, so, but here one would have to look very carefully and to think this is obviously being done. Um, you know, do, do, who do you hit with these economic sanctions or sector sanctions? But, of, <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, if there's geopolitical interest, perhaps not to fully increase or completely increase uh, uh, Belarusian dependency on, on the Russian Federation. And I think if we're thinking sanctions, perhaps some uh, sanctions also against uh, Bela, uh, Russian oligarchs involved in uh, Belarusian businesses. I mean, that's, that could also be effective, but uh, probably can't, can't really be done. And then perhaps also the last point, um, yeah, again, what is important is also the signaling. So, so one shouldn't forget 
you know that that that, that the impact also on civil society that the EU is there and that it cares and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think with measures, uh, one has to be uh, realistic. Maybe a last point. It's important. I think in, in the past, the EU's policy was very much focused, or conditionality was focused on political prisoners and the release of political prisoners. Now that's very important, obviously. Um, but perhaps a policy in the future should be a bit more consistent, perhaps con yeah, uh, focused or conditional on more than just political prisoners and their release. Again, policy has been more than that, uh, but, but there was this, uh, we're lifting sanctions if so and so many political prisoners are being released. Uh, perhaps try to, yeah, to yeah, be, be a little bit broader and more consistent in the future, but well, we can discuss more later. Thank you. Thank you, um, Gisela. Before I move on, I would, as you were talking about um, Russia, uh, um, I would just like to put a, one of the questions we have here from Jerome uh, Legrand, um, who was asking how far is Russia willing to help and can really help improve the situation in Belarus? Um, is Putin basically in, an influence to, in a position to influence a transition of power? Um, building on the positive vision of Belarusians towards Russians, do we discuss Belarus with Russia and can the EU make proposals for joint cooperation on Belarus? Or is that, that's very controversial that bit at the end afterwards. So do you have a, a reply to that? Is that to me? Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, uh, Russia, Russia has clear geopolitical interests um, in Belarus. So in any cooperation, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure where that would take the EU. It is very clear, you know, one of these interests are, of course, for the Russian Federation, uh, cooperation, uh, interoperability of the armed forces, uh, because that would take also Russian Federation very close uh, to the uh, border, of course, and that is important for Russian uh, strategy vis-a-vis -vis NATO. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and then, of course, we also have cooperation in the security sphere, uh, a cooperation agreement was sound, uh, signed, uh, the interior is uh, support by Russian Federation for Oman, uh, this uh, very notorious uh, national security service um, uh, of, 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 of the forces that are responsible for most of the torture and, uh, and high, uh, kidnappings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, there's an interest by Russian Federation to get close to the Belarus-Ukraine border, amongst other, uh, other things. Um, and and I would say, yeah, for, for for Russia to support Lukashenko, I mean, it's not it's not yeah support. Hmm. Yeah, of course he can he stays in power, and they give him the loans, uh, they continue the subsidies, uh, but there's, there's obviously no friendly relations whatsoever. So for I think for for Russia, this is a fantastic situation, where uh, you know the as I said before, the isolation. The more the West isolates uh, Belarus, the the more influence. Russia has on Lukashenko. And they've also been, and talking about you know, working together on new government, well, <laughs> I think the, the, if, if Russian Federation has a plan <laughs> for the replacement of Lukashenko, it's a replacement, of course, you know, with, with a Russia-friendly uh, uh, people, uh, government, and, uh, and they have been, and this is quite interesting, um, the Russian Federation, they have been uh, taken uh, or given good uh, positions um, in companies and elsewhere uh, to uh, people from the Belarusian nomenclatura who um, Lukashenko had initially kicked out. So, you know, they have people there in positions. The question is just, yeah, you know, how, how do you get them back into the country and then into government? But that's also a threat. So, so, so that the Russian, I mean, also uh, can put pressure partly on Lukashenko in this way. So cooperation, you know, better you know, with the Russian Federation and the EU installing different government. I don't really see that happening. <laughs> um, it's probably also not the best way to, to go forward, but uh, surely you also see now uh, that, that the uh, uh, dependence on Russia is increasing and, and that Lukashenko is, yeah, his, his room for maneuver is, is greatly uh, decreased. Um, also now when it comes to lendings and, and uh, capital markets, I mean, there's a stronger orientation of, of Russia towards, uh, of, of Belarus towards Russia. That's, I mean, there's various indicators, but I don't go into it. Okay, thank you very much, Gisar. I want to come back to you now, Dirk, because there was a few questions in the chat box um, for you, um, also related, I have to say, um, to Russia, but not only. Um, first of all, from Natalia Van Zaten-Likova, 
um, who's asking if the pressure by sanctions is increased on Belarus, will it not simply become part um, of Russia um, shortly? Um, we also have a question about cigarette smuggling, um, but this is a big business um, for Belarus. So is there more that the EU could actually do um, to stop this um, cigarette smuggling um, business um, that is going on? Um, and then I'm going to put another question from uh, Klaus Klipp, who's asking, um, does the EU in the context of its global strategy work on instruments which become more effective, like the US extraterritorial ter sanctions? Um, I think that can also be um, a question for uh, you, uh, Mache. But I give the floor to you first, first Durka, then I'll come back because we have quite a few questions here. Okay, thank you very much, um, uh, Amanda. Uh, Yuk, uh, this is of course the, the eternal question. Increased sanctions leads the country closer to Russia. This is what we have heard from the Belarusian leadership for all this time. You should support us uh, because otherwise we have no other choice than to go to Russia. But of course we should allow ourselves the question uh, that we do we what what is better do we want to uh, see how uh, more and more political prisoners are made how violence is increasing how the space for any uh, democratic or movement or civil society movement is closed uh, in in a situation in, in in a way that it exists nowhere in Europe uh, cynically speaking one should say that the human rights situation in Russia is clearly better than here uh, that is uh, not a compliment, uh, of course, because the situation in Russia is also getting worse. Some people say that Putin is following Lukashenko's footpath. Um, so uh, I think uh, it's a question that cannot be answered as simply as this. Uh, it is our only means, uh, the sanctions that we have at our disposal in the first place. And we can only hope that the regime comes to reason and comes to the understanding that it, there is no way out if they want to be only with Russia, if they want to or they will, be, they will have to be only with Russia and other uh, like-minded partners, and there are only very few of those, uh, if they do not uh, react to our demands. Uh, cigarette smuggling, it's a long-term problem, by the way, not only Belarus, the neighboring countries uh, are also profiting, uh, prof do also find this a profitable business, or some people in neighboring countries further south. Uh, we have uh, people dealing with this also in our delegations uh, who deal with this uh, topic. And we try, we have indeed, indeed addressed this many a time to the Belarusian authorities as well to come back to Belarus, but uh, so far to no avail. But uh, I can tell you that the cigarette sector is one of those sectors that we're also looking into right now when it comes uh, to potential sexual, section, sexual sanctions. But I cannot tell you more whether this will succeed or not. That depends on the discussions uh, among member states. Uh, Extraterritorial territorial sanctions. Well, look, the Magnitsky Act, I think that was also a question if I saw the look in the chat. Uh, you know, it is easier for us, uh, for those countries uh, with which we have a already a territorial sanctions regime, it is easier to apply this what we have than to apply Magnitsky. Actually, the Magnitsky Act would limit us a bit more uh, than what we have. So for the time being, we are not using the Magnitsky White Act, but we are using the the uh, the, um, the existing national, uh, national uh, sanctions regime. Uh, but I do not, do not exclude that this might happen in the future. It could, uh, it could be, of course. I'll stop here if you have many other questions still. Okay, thank you. Um, now to you, Mr. Papaski, we have a question um, asking what concrete impact have the sanctions had on, on Belarus? Um, if you could take that one. And a second question maybe I can put to you as well, um, which is regarding illegal migration. Um, can we expect Belarus to use illegal migration as a, politi a political weapon against the EU, um, given the fact that the number of illegal crossings to, over the Lithuanian border has already risen? It, look, um, sanctions are uh, difficult to quantify in the short, even mid-term. So um, um, we spoke about the... Uh, uh, the flight ban on on on, on Belavia, but it will not. Uh, I mean, well, okay, that that is that is that is hitting the the regime's interest. Maybe not in a decisive way. If any additional economic sanctions are imposed, then it we would be able to, to quantify the impact. I mean, we know what this what the the key sectors of the Belarusian economy are and what the main source of income of the regime are. So that that that's going to uh, that's going to make a, make a difference. Um, 
just on this uh, notion of extraterritorial sanctions, we, we don't do them. I mean, we've been always struggling with that uh, concept in, in the past, in particular with the, with the uh, extraterritorial effect of, of US sanctions, whether it was on Libya or, or Iran or, or other, uh, other cases. But indeed, this newly adopted uh, uh, worldwide human rights sanction framework that, that came on stream in, in December, is having an impact. So we've already had a long number of listings of, of Belarusian, Chinese, or Venezuelan officials. So that's going to um, to continue on migration. I, I know that there is there is an increased movement, and 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 and, and migrants are being channeled actively by the regime to Lithuania in particular. So the, the government has already alerted other member states. So we're watching that that space. We've seen it in the past uh, in other uh, in uh, on on along other migration routes in the eastern Mediterranean uh, and the western Mediterranean in particular. Um, so now we'll have to see whether we have to mobilize any additional assistance. That is possible. And so, for instance, the uh, the Frontex agency is now equipped to um, to lend short-term support to countries uh, that are uh, affected by a sudden influx of uh, of irregular migrants. Thank you. Maybe I can add an additional question to you as well from Jana uh, Masaradze. Um, and she's asking, how is the Belarus case shaping the EU's approach towards Russia? Is the EU planning to have a containment strategy towards Russia? How would such a strategy, if present, um, envision its cooperation with the US? I, I, I've lost you for a second. So I'm not sure I understood the question properly. Uh, OK, maybe I'll just shorten it to how is Belarus how is Belarus shaping the EU's approach towards Russia I mean how will it impact on the EU's oh, okay. policy um the EU actually has a policy um towards Look, this is one of many uh, many problems that we have with Russia not the only one but but one of many and then and, and of course it just adds to the complexity of our relationship that is uh, that's been growing for for some time, unfortunately, um, uh, and 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 I think you know, we 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 stick to our principles and to our values, and and that's certainly the right way. Um, so, if ever we manage to to build up uh, a more uh, forward-looking and positive agenda, that would have an impact on on the developments on Belarus, but Belarus, but it's not. Uh, uh, not imminent, um, unfortunately. Um, thank you very much. Um, now, just coming back to you, Gisela, I would like to put this question to you. Um, can there be a transatlantic strategy um, towards Russia, considering the Belarus case and Eastern partnership in general? Would this have more emphasis on containment rather than a dual track approach of containment and engagement? <laughs> Tricky question. It depends on what the Germans think about it. Um, no, I would. Uh, I, I. I think that this would be. I think a, a transatlantic strategy would would certainly. Uh, yeah, I, I think that would help. I, I'm just not quite sure whether you know the EU is is fully in line with the US's approach, and certainly a number of member states uh, who we know um, have uh, have also very much the, put the emphasis that there needs to be a dual track approach, that there needs to be engage, engagement uh, with the Russian Federation. Um, but uh, and it also depends, you know, what comes out of the meeting between uh, Biden uh, and Putin that is about to happen. So it's quite curious. I think it would be interesting to see what what comes out of of that. The the relations uh, between the US, uh, the EU, and the Russian Federation at are at their very lowest. So I think one cannot. I, I don't know how how much worse it can possibly get. Um, I, th I think to keep. To keep the channel of communication open is still is still very important. To think if a solution should be found also on Ukraine, Ukraine crisis, um, uh, on the uh, on on uh, on Belarus, yeah, conversation with Russian Federation is is, is yeah difficult to yeah, to avoid. It is not it's not possible. So I think if one wants to move forward, I think just sanctions alone, um, uh, just containment alone. Is, is I think in the short term that is possibly uh, a, a measure that works, but in the longer term, I think for solutions on these various protective prices, 
um, is, is very difficult, but that's of course a very controversial issue. Um, and, and you can see, uh, yeah, of course, also in the literature and in different European countries also look at this differently. Um, but um, I, I think at least that the approach by the US vis-a-vis -vis Russian Federation um, is perhaps a bit more, yeah, a bit more predictable um, than it was under the Trump administration, also for the Europeans, and that is in principle a good thing. Thank you, um, Gisela. Now I have a an, a question um, from Jérôme de Grand, which is to both of, to both you, uh, Dirk and uh, you, Mache. Um and he's basically asking the security situation um in belarus having you know russian troops etc around is that if yes is there going to be a csdp dimension to be to be developed um in relation to belarus case i mean obviously russian troops aren't yet as far as i'm aware having a military base or whatnot in belarus but we can see the infrastructure is becoming more um enhanced so could there be a csdp um element here in the eu's policy coming up Thank you, uh, Amanda, and thanks to Jerome as well. Uh, let me just start by, by adding one line on the transatlantic uh, dimension, if I may, from the previous question, because I find this very important. And I can tell you that we are here on the ground working extremely closely with our US colleagues. And I can tell you that since the new administration took office uh, in Washington, it is really much, much closer. And we are basically on one line. Again, we are coordinating ourselves very much. And I know that this is also in, in case in the case uh, like this in, between Brussels and Washington on a central level. So um, that is indeed uh, very important that we speak with one voice. And uh, here on the ground, I can tell you it is very, very close. Um, uh, security situation in Belarus. Well, uh, so far, uh, if Lukashenko has done one thing successfully, that is he has been able to prevent uh, Russian troops of being stationed here for a permanent time. We will see now what happens after the next Zapad exercise, which is going to take place in, uh, in September. Okay, Dirk seems to, Dirk? If his position still, further, seems to be sorry, you froze there for a few seconds. I see. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, sorry for this. Um, uh, I said, uh, look, uh, so far Lukashenko has been successful in one thing, which is uh, preventing from Rus having Rus Russian troops on the ground. But that might well happen in the future. Nobody can predict this. It depends on, the, on how strong he will be perceived by Moscow. Uh, and that uh, is, uh, is, of course, difficult to say. CSDP dimension, you know, um, uh, officially Belarus is still, par still a partner uh, in the Partnership for Peace uh, official exercise. They're doing pretty little in this, but uh, they're not, uh, they're, they're still part of it. Um, I do not, uh, uh, I think it will depend on the further developments and how far Russia will get involved uh, in, in, in military terms in, in Belarus. For the time being, there's no such need, but it might well uh, become, uh, such need might well, might well be, become in the future. Look, um, on the security first, um, uh, of course, um, one thing that we should uh, recall is that the level of uh, integration and interoperability between the Russian and Belarusian army is very high. I mean, they're basically using the same doctrine, trained in the same academy, so um, it's, it's not that far away. And of course, they are not present in the country, but, but they are using a lot of military infrastructure. I mean, the Zapat exercise is a good, a good example. Uh, for me, the question of uh, whether or not there will be a CSDP dimension is, is a bit hypothetical because the, the main question is to do what? What can a CSDP mission do? Most of them, I mean, it's a vast majority, most of the CSDP missions, both civilian and military, are training missions. Uh, I could well imagine in the future Belarus kind of an advisory mission that would help develop democratic standards for police or, or armed forces, but, but I think it's, it's really a, a long way off. So for the time being, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it's a, it's a realistic um, um, uh, option. Okay, thank you, Dirk. Um, Jerome, you as we only have a few minutes left, um, I would just like to put a couple of, of closing questions. First of all, to 
um, to you, Dirk, and to you, Maché. Um, if you could give a piece of advice to the Belarusian opposition, um, what would it be? I mean, what would, what would be the thing that you think would be the most useful um, for them to do now, in addition to what they have been doing? Um, and to you, Giselle, what would be your advice to the, to the European Union? What would be the thing you think they should do immediately um, that they haven't done so far? Okay, I will start then. Um, um, so maybe I give. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I think the most important thing is that they stay together. We have basically three main camps. We have the camp uh, in Vilnius around Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. Um, uh, we have the camp um, uh, around Pavel Latushko, who is based in Warsaw. And then we have the so-called Babariko camp. Uh, they are spread all over, mainly in jail, of course, but not only. Uh, so they need to stay together, although they have potentially slightly different views on the future of the country. But I think the most important thing is to stay together and to and they do that. They try to do this by regular meetings of those who are not in jail in, in Vilnius or in Warsaw, and um, and that is that is good. And of course, uh, I think as difficult as this, that would be my second piece of advice, is always to offer uh, a dialogue option. I know it is getting every day more difficult to imagine a dialogue with the Lukashenko regime. Uh, it is very difficult to imagine, but I think it's the only way out uh, that, that, that there is. Uh, we are not in favor of violence, that is why for any peaceful solution it needs to be based on dialogue. So they should reach out their hand constantly what Svetlana Tikhanovsky also has been doing uh, in, the, in, the, in the past uh, weeks and months. And I hope that this will continue because of course, uh, with months and months passing without any positive outcome, it is getting more and more difficult for them to keep restraint. Uh, but I think this is the only way forward. I absolutely uh, agree with Dick's uh, call for unity. This is key. I mean, the divisions are natural. We have them everywhere, but it's not for now. They really need to stay united and 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 keep develop uh, a message, a message of hope, of 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 reassurance. Um, also, um, they I think they they need a bit of capacity building. I mean, of course they are they are weak and they are under pressure, but uh, but if they want to sustain the fight, they have to they have they need to have structures. They need to have people who can who can carry on, and and we are certainly ready to support them. Thank you. Um, Gisela? Yeah, thank you very much. I think the, the biggest message is yeah, united, uh, stay united. And I think it would, uh, that, that's for all the member states. And I would also say that it's very important to send a signal um, next week um, that there will be follow up actions and that there will be sanctions. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, if, if there aren't, I think it's not just the world watching as such, it's not just Belarusian Russians watching, but I think it's also um, dictatorships and autocrats around the world watching and looking, oh, you know, I mean, if we take down a plane, if we hijack a plane, if we pursue our opponents abroad and send the message, it doesn't matter where you are, you're not safe, uh, what is the reaction uh, by the Western world? And, and I think for that reason, it's also extremely important that the EU does show muscle and there is also on the transatlantic level um, uh, that, that, yeah, that, that the message is being sent, um, not just to the Lukashenko regime, uh, but also uh, to uh, other autocrats around the world. You know, this, this, this doesn't, you, know, you don't get away from it, at least not uh, lightheartedly. And of course, also united position towards the Russian Federation. I think it, maybe, yeah, the direction of that can, yeah, you can discuss. Um, but it has to be united reaction, uh, because that is the strongest reaction towards Russian Federation, and then they can't play off member states against one another. So very important. And um, third point, attach conditionality to the restrictive measures and also stick to them and not just about political prisoners. Um, so that, that, that would also be important. Um, uh, it has to be also the human rights situation in the country. And in 2016, the lifting of the sanctions, we did not see that many changes in the human rights situation. And we warned against this. Um, and I think the con yeah, a consequence can be seen uh, that the regime did not fundamentally change. So it's important uh, to keep that in mind. But of course, you know, it's easy for me to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, um, Giselle. Um, we've run out of time. So I need to close this meeting. I would like to thank all of you for joining us today um, and partaking in, I think, what was a very interesting, but more importantly, very important discussion um, for outlining what the EU is actually doing um, in this very difficult situation. I mean, I really feel from the bottom of my heart 
from the poor people living in Belarus, the situation that they're going through, those that are in prison um, and those that have been injured or worse. Uh, the situation there remains absolutely critical, which is why it's so important that the EU keeps this topic really at the top of its agenda. You know, we know that there's other things that come along, other problems, other crises, and sometimes we see topics slip down. Um, but this one is just so, so important. It needs to remain there. We need to keep this strong focus um, and continue to push back against this absolutely terrible regime uh, that continues to rule this country. Um, so thank you for your, for your time today. Um, EPC will be con continuing to follow developments in Belarus um, very closely. I hope by the time that we have the next event, which will probably be on the anniversary of the, 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 uh, the fraudulent mm -hmm. elections, that there will have been some positive change in the country. I keep my fingers crossed, really I do. Um, so thank you all again. And thanks to the audience for joining us today. Um, for putting your questions. Um, and it's only left for me to say, I wish you a pleasant um, remainder of the day. So thank you all again and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.